Good morning. Well, today is kind of a special day around our house. We consider this day a holiday. My daughter woke me up this morning and she said, Happy Super Bowl Sunday, Daddy. I said, Oh, yes. Yes. Jeremy called me this morning about 7 o'clock in tears. He said that because his Steelers started the season so well and finished so bad and didn't make it to the Super Bowl, he couldn't face you all this morning. I could tell by the sound on the other end of the phone and, and the, the tears that were coming out of his eyes, uh, I could tell he just he didn't have the courage to get up here and, and talk to you guys on Super Bowl Sunday, knowing that he's a Steelers fan. There's no other Steelers fans here this morning, so you all know what we're talking about, right? Okay. Well, um, no, Pastor Jeremy's got it. I don't know what it is, but it's been going around. So um, there's cold, it's a cold season and then it's COVID season. So it's just to be playing it safe. So that's what he's doing. He doesn't feel like he's got anything that's going to drag on for weeks or months. He just felt like he probably shouldn't be here this morning. And we thank him, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this is going south. <laughs> But um, I'm so glad to be here um, this morning. Um, he says, hey, Jeremy says, hey, do you have a sermon in your pocket that you could like pull out? And I said, sure thing. So this is a sermon we did in 2012. Wow, can you believe this has been almost 11 years ago that we did this sermon? And you'll be able to understand that we have made a lot of improvements since then. And one of the major things that we've improved is how we put stuff up on the screen. Uh, we no longer use color for the backdrop. Aaron does a great job. But this is one that I threw together, like I said, back in 2012. So I apologize if you can't see it real well. Um, this is a type of sermon also where you jump around a lot in the Bible. So most of the scripture is up on the screen. So don't feel like you have to flip. I know that um, there's a lot of comfort in bringing your Bible to church and looking up the verses in the passages in the Bible. But today, we don't necessarily have to do that because we're going to jump around quite a bit. This is a topical sermon rather than a passage sermon, okay? So the topic that we're going to look at tonight is the Bema Seat of Christ. And if you look at this... Um, and I draw attention to your handout here, and we'll get started. Let's open with a word of prayer here. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we can come and worship you here this morning. Lord, we pray for Pastor Jeremy and his family. Pray for quick healing in that family, Lord. We pray that you would build him up this week and give him a good day off, Lord. We just pray that you would be a part of this sermon this morning. We welcome you into this building. We ask that you would pierce our hearts with your scripture this morning, Lord. We ask that you would build us up for another week. Lord, we ask a blessing over each and every one here today. And we also ask the blessing over those who are watching at home or wherever they may be this morning, Lord. We just thank you for your word. And we ask that it would be a blessing to us this morning. It's a name, in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Judgment. When you talk about judgment, sometimes people get a little worried about what is he going to say? What's he going to preach about when he talks about judgment? Bema judgment. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, there's two judgments. Everybody gets judged. Bible tells us this, okay? There are two judgments covering all people. There is the white throne judgment. Okay, this is for non-Christians. This is, this is the judgment that you don't want to have. Okay? If you look up on the screen here, I've got the verses for you. 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. All. Everybody. Non-Christians, Christians. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. We deserve it. We know we deserve it, right? Okay. If you go to the next slide there. 
Okay, the white throne judgment is for non-Christians. This is the judgment that you don't want to have. This is the judgment that we as believers need to reach our families, our friends, um, those in our community, the world. This is, this is a judgment we want to try to keep people from by bringing them into a relationship with Christ. Okay? The second judgment. This is the Bema judgment for, of Christ is for Christians. Now you may be thinking, whoa, how can I be judged as a Christian? Well, then we're going to unpack that this morning. But this is not a judgment of sin. Okay? And this is not a requirement of faith. Okay? There is no judgment of sin involved for the Christian. We know this because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Okay? When God looks at us, we are filtered through Christ. He sees Christ when, he, when God looks at us because Christ has covered us with His sacrifice that God no longer sees our sin. He sees His Son, Jesus. So we know for a fact that we cannot be judged for our sins because Christ is, through Christ we are forgiven of our sins. In John 5.24 it tells us, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. This is for the followers. This is for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Okay? We have already passed from death into life. Okay? This, is, this is leading up to the Bema Seat of Christ. And... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4-5, through 5, um, Paul tells us, My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord Himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time, before the Lord returns. For He will bring your darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give each one whatever praises due. Uncomfortable situation. Bringing our darkest secrets to light. Now, I'm going to confess that I'm a sinner. And I want to tell you that there is sins that I'm not going to confess this morning right in front of you in public or on the internet, okay? I don't want you to know about them. Okay? But I'm going to tell you that there is one who knows about them. Okay? And that's Jesus. He knows my sin. Okay? And it says right here that He will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. These are the motives that only us know, that only we think about. Okay? And He will give each one of us whatever praise is due. It's an uncomfortable situation. It's an uncomfortable situation. But it doesn't have to be. Okay? Can you go to the next slide? When will the Bema judgment happen? We can go into Revelations, and this is in Revelations 19.8, okay? It says right here, it says, She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, okay? This is the church, okay? The church has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. Remember, the Bible tells us, and we can sing about it in our hymns, that we have been washed white as snow. Okay? When we rise up with Christ and we go to this marriage feast of the Lamb, we will have the finest linen. We will look our best. Okay? Fine linens signify that the church has already experienced the beam of judgment and is wearing the rewards to the wedding feast. Now if we think about this, okay, if we think about this just a little bit, some people wear their best garments when they go somewhere. Or it doesn't necessarily have to be your tux that you wear. Scott Fred wears his tux sometimes, places. No. Scott's about as dressed up as he gets right there, right? <laughs> Flannel shirt. He's warm. He's still got his coat on. But 
to each of us, we bring our best. And what this signifies is that we will have our best. This occurs at or following the rapture of the church in a pre-tribulational rapture view. Now that's some strong words right there. Pre-tribulational rapture view, which in my mind is what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that God takes his church and we're out of here before all those nasty plagues are open and the seals are opened in Revelations. If you, if you read through those seals, they are not good. Torture, punishment, all of those things. But it doesn't say anything in Revelations that the church will directly be forced into those seals. So we are looking at this from a pre-tribulational rapture view. Okay, moving right along. In Luke chapter 19, and I apologize, see this is what I said, we've gotten better at this, okay? We've gotten better at this, this is really small, so let me read it to you. This is what Jesus says, he says, A nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with, little, with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor over ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made it five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you if you knew that I am a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvest crops I didn't plant. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use it, use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. The nature of the judgment. Okay, Christians have God-given abilities in this life to do the will of the Lord. God has given it to each and every one of us. Is it the same? No. This story tells us that some of us have this talent, some of us have another talent, but together we work, it works together to bring the will of the Lord to the people. Okay? We have different amounts of reward based off of our own abilities. The Lord's not going to ask more of us than what we have abilities to do. Okay. Is there punishment for the Christian? No. No. This is not about punishment. The Bema judgment of Christ is about reward. It is not about punishment. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 tells us this. It says, But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. A little bit later in Hebrews chapter 10, the author tells us, Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Whew! Is that great? When our sins are forgiven, they're gone. When we be appear before Christ, He's not going to say, He's not going to say to us, your sins are not forgiven. He's going to say, I don't even see your sin because they have been forgiven. They're gone. Is there public of exposure of unconfessed sins or humiliation? The answer is no. 
We can look in, we find this in scripture. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22 it says, I have swept your sins away like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. Oh, return for me, for I have paid the price to set you free. We are free in Christ. Psalms 103 verse 12 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. A very common verse that explains how far we are from our sins. He's removed it. He's taken it away from us. The next verse comes in. We can look at the negative aspects. Okay? The negative aspects of the Bema judgment of Christ is this. There will be a noticeable loss of rewards. Okay? It will be noticeable. It will be noticeable by us. A real loss that will be noticeable to other believers in heaven. Okay? Now this doesn't mean that you don't get into heaven. It just means when you get to heaven, we will understand how many opportunities we didn't take. How many times we didn't do what the Lord really wanted us to do. How many times we didn't talk to somebody about Christ when we knew we should have. Those opportunities we will remember. Okay? The basic idea, this is Samuel L. Hoyt, wrote this. He wrote a book on this. He said, the basic idea is loss or forfeiture of reward which one could have received. Okay? For each Christian there is a potential reward. We have the potential. However, if the believer is not faithful, he will lose that reward. Not in the sense that he once had that reward and it's taken away. But he will lose it in the sense that he could have had it. We could have had that. But we didn't do it. Maybe we didn't follow what the Lord had told us to do. Or, or we gave up on a ministry. Or we didn't talk to that one person about Christ. We didn't take advantage of those opportunities that Christ put before us. The loss of reward is eternal. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.25, he says, All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. If the reward is eternal, then so is the loss of the reward. We have an eternal prize. The next point is, the comparison to commencement. Now, I've got to make a great illustration for you here. And I've got to go back to my high school years. How many of you knew me in high school? Yes! None of you! Woo! Those were some weird times. Anybody want to relate? High school's weird? Nobody? Nobody? No high schoolers here? I know there's some high schoolers here. It's a weird time. When I went to commencement, okay, all of us graduated. Everybody went through commencement. But one of my best friends was Valid Victorian. And one of my other friends was Salutatorian. And they got to get up in front of everybody and they got these awards. Very high honor. They worked very hard for that. And I remember sitting there, listening to their speech, wondering if I could have tried harder, if I could, if I would have tried harder, could have, would have, should have? And I was sitting there and I was thinking, no, that's too much work. But the truth is, is that I still graduated. I still graduated, but I didn't receive any high honors. But maybe I could have. And that's what this Bema judgment seat of Christ is like. We all get to heaven. We all get there because we are followers of Jesus. But there's opportunities in this life that we will be rewarded for when we get to heaven. Just like how I was in that graduation ceremony wondering why I couldn't have been valedictorian. Now I know why because I really wasn't that smart. But those people were honored. And that's an illustration of what this Bema Seed is. We could be sitting there in heaven, glad that we got in, 
Glad that we, we are made it to heaven. Yes, we have the eternal prize. But just how it was, graduating high school, I, didn't, I was sad that I didn't receive the awards that were available, but I was really glad that I graduated high school. And there was a lot of people who were really glad I graduated too, especially my parents. <laughs> These are the crowns that we receive. Paul calls them crowns when he talks about these rewards in the Bible. Okay? These are the crown rewards. Okay? The first one, or we can talk about these. The crown rewards, okay, this should be a time of excitement for the Christian. Okay, these are the crowns. These are when we sing, um, crown me with many crowns, or um, there are other to hymns that mention these crowns that, that we are trying to strive for, these rewards. They are reserved for those who have lived lives of special service for the Lord. These are rewards. These are five special crown rewards are mentioned in the Bible. And there may be more rewards, but these five are in the Bible. Okay, the first one. The incorruptible crown. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9.25 tells us that every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. This is King James Version. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incor incorruptible crown. Okay. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize. That will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Okay. The incorruptible crown... Okay, the life of an athlete requires self-discipline and self-control. Both requirements are important to resisting sin. Those of us who resist sin in our lives will receive the incorruptible crown. You see, sin doesn't corrupt us. We push it away. Okay, it's given to the disciplined believer. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, talking about athlete again, it says, An athlete cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. Following Christ's rules men, means leaving a sinless life. Can we do it? No. But we can be disciplined in our approach. The disciplined believer will be the recipient of this crown. We must be disciplined in our lives. We must resist the sin. We cannot let it to corrupt us. We must push it away. Is it a constant battle? Yeah. It's constant. Satan's right here. He's right here. He says, Rusty, you know you want to. Do it. Nobody's looking. Do it. It's right there, but we must resist that. Okay? We must strive. The next one is the crown of righteousness. This is, comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Timothy says, I have found, I have fought, or Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing given to those believers who especially resisted the sins of the world given to believers who lived every day in light of the Lord's return a pattern for life something that we should strive for live each and every day as if the Lord's coming back tonight do you have a to-do list do you have a list of people you want to talk to about Jesus? Get with it. Do it tonight. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. The next one is the crown of glory. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, And now a word to you who are elders in the church, I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in His glory when He is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. 
Not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. This goes deeper. This is presented to faithful pastors who, number one, they serve willingly. They serve sacrificially. They serve eagerly. And they lead by godly example. Now this may be, may be pointed towards pastors. But if you read that verse in Peter, it talks about leading. It talks about serving. It's not just for pastors. How many of us serve in FBT clubs? We have a great group of leaders that show up and put up with junior and senior high school on Wednesday night in here. We had 27 junior hires the other night. It was fun. We had a great time. But we eagerly do it. Not because of what our reward will be, but because we want to do it unselfishly. We want to just do it because it's what's required of us. Okay? The next one, the crown of rejoicing. This is the soul winner's crown. Okay? This is the believer's eternal joy comes from seeing all the people that they have been instrumental in leading to Christ in heaven. Can you believe it? A day when you can see everybody that you had a part of leading to Christ. What a great day that'll be. We spread a lot of seed here at, F at the Fulton Baptist Temple. We spread a ton of seed. And we know what the Bible tells us about that seed. Some of it gets peck, or picked up by the crows before it even hits the ground, it seems like. Some of it goes and, and then the sun beats it away. And some of it gets root, but then it withers in the sun under pressure. But there's a little bit of it that takes root and grows. To be able to see that growth, and then when we get to heaven... I just pray that we will, each and every one of us, be able to see one person that we didn't even know they were a Christian, but we spread that gospel to them. That opportunity. It is always a joy. Danielle and I have been doing youth ministry for almost 20 years. Okay? And every now and then we will bump into somebody that we haven't seen for a long time. Or I'll get a text from somebody and they'll say, hey, something awesome happened. And they'll say, I led somebody else to Christ. And I'm like, man, I didn't even know you were a Christian. <laughs> Amen. What an awesome time that'll be when all of us get to see the work that we've done and the blessing it'll be when they get to heaven. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, After all, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when He returns? It's you. That's what gives us our joy. Those that maybe we talk to about Christ, and they're there. They're in heaven. I have some friends that were in the youth group in Bremen. This is years ago. I haven't lived in Bremen since 2010. And they still text me. They text me when bad things happen. They text me when good things happen. I went to one of their weddings. And he came up to me and Danielle at that wedding. And he said, it's because of you that I was able to meet this fine Christian woman. Because if I wouldn't have started believing so many years ago, I wouldn't have been headed down God's path for me. I almost cried and I don't cry. That's how it'll be. That joy. Okay? This is not competitive. I'm not in competition with you. I am not going to try to steal your reward or your crown. It's reserved for anyone of influence in bringing another to a relationship with Christ. Now, that friend of mine 
who said, it was because of you. Was it because of me alone? No. The more you talk to him, there's been dozens of people that have brought him along that path. He has a friend, and it's a pastor friend that he met at college, that built him up in Christ. You see, it's for all of us. It takes all of us. You never know when what you've said or the seed that you have planted will open the door for the next person in a Super Bowl term to move that ball down the field. That's what it's all about. Moving the ball down the field. F.B. Meyer, this is going clear back to 1910. This is what he wrote. He said, We allot the crown to the pastor or evangelist who fervent whose fervent appeal is to win the largest number of accessions or additions to the church, but Christ will not forget the church official and the chairwoman, the one who cleans the church, the treasurer, the secretary, the organ player, <laughs> and those who bring refreshments to the harvest field. Oh, I love those people. The players on the instruments shall be there as well as the singers, and he that sowed shall rejoice with whom who reaped. You see, this isn't a reward reserved for just one. This is a re reward reserved for all of us. It takes all of us. You may think, well, all I do is bake cookies. Hey, that's part of this thing we've got going here at the Fulton Baptist Temple. We eat we enjoy our fellowship time. We bring people into our fellowship. I've been praying so hard for this sportsman banquet. I've already invited probably more people than I should. Because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to share the gospel with those who may not be comfortable to hear it. But under that circumstance of a free pulled pork sandwich may actually hear the gospel that night. You see, it's everybody. It takes all of us. The next one, the crown of life. This is the martyr's or sufferer's crown. This is the only crown reward mentioned twice in the Bible. Okay? James chapter 1 verse 12 says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. Those who endure testing and temptation. Okay. Revelation chapter 2.10 says, Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for ten days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing, facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Remain faithful. It's hard. Followers of Christ will not be equal in heaven. Think about that. Okay? Just like I was in high school, we will all be there and we will all be so pleased to be there and it will be an amazing thing. But believers will be judged by their works for the Lord. Okay? Rewards will be given to those who faithfully serve the Lord and make Him a focal point in their lives. Believers should be both motivated and encouraged by the potential rewards in heaven. Here's our application. Okay? Once the believer leaves this earth, the Bema judgment is final. We only have one shot at this life. Okay? Once the believer leaves the earth, they are no longer able to change what they have done while on earth. You can remember the story Jesus told about the, the uh, man who went to hell. And he said, he said, oh, just go back and tell my brothers. Please, just go back and tell them. He said, no. You can't go back and tell them after you're dead. Jesus was clear on that. Once a believer leaves the earth, they are no longer able to change what they have done while on earth. There is no way to regain the, award, the rewards of this judgment after the fact. You can't go back. So here's our application. Don't miss the opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. Christians must have their eye on the prize. We must have our eye on the prize. The opportunities are here in this life. Okay? We must have our eye on it. 
My eyes on it. Is yours? Is yours? That's what I'll leave you with this morning. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunities. Lord, I just ask, as we leave here this morning, you will open the door for opportunities for each and every one of us this week. Lord, I pray that you will give us the courage to follow through with your will. Lord, I ask that you would give us the courage to go and talk to those people that need to hear the gospel, Lord. That you would, you would open their hearts and their minds, Lord. That you would give us that opportunity to plant the seed of your gospel. Lord, I ask that this message would be an encouragement to each and every one of us that the work that we do for you is important. Lord, I ask that those of us who have, who have maybe been struggling or been feeling down in our ministry, Lord, that this sermon would build us up. Lord, that this would bring it back into focus for us. That we have a reason to work. That we have a reason to push forward each and every day with your will for our lives. Lord, we ask so much of you. And Lord, we thank you for what you give us. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time of fellowship down at the FBT Center. Lord, we ask that you would bless the food that's been prepared down there. We ask that you would give us a great time of fellowship, that we may build each other up during this time. Lord, we ask that you would be with Pastor Jeremy and his family. We ask that you would be tif with Tiffany and the baby. Lord, we ask that you would protect them. Lord, we ask that you would bring them back to us next week full of rest and fired up for you. Lord, I ask that you would be a part with each and every one of us as we go from here this week. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.